Good evening, everybody. Welcome to night seven of Lambda School's mini boot camp. My name is Deandra Ryan Moss. I'm an instructor here at Lambda School, and I am teaching you guys live tonight from Bisbee, Arizona. So we are on night seven out of eight. So we're really about to wrap up here. Uh, last week, we covered some HTML, CSS, and introduced JavaScript. And this week has been all JavaScript. So hopefully, uh, um, you're all getting challenged as we go deeper into JavaScript. And don't worry, tonight and tomorrow night are going to be challenging as well. We're going to get into some really cool, powerful topics in JavaScript. I'm super excited about it. Before we do that, let me tell you a little bit about Lambda School. Lambda School is a six-month, entirely online web development and computer science immersive. So it is a non-traditional school that will teach you everything you need to know to be a programmer. What's really cool about Lambda School is that it's extremely oriented towards those day-to-day -day skills that you would actually use as a web developer. So we cover full stack web development, front end, back end, as well as the frameworks that come up again and again. Um, you'll be practicing actually utilizing these skills through projects and other assignments. Um, at Lambda School, we do a combination of, uh, we certainly do live lectures and group work, homework, but we also have a lot of solo time where you're just coding. So it really is quite hands-on. And beyond just teaching you the practical skills, we do like to round you out as a developer. So we also do cover algorithms, some C, as well as Python to just give you little insights into some other worlds apart from web development. So when you come out of the six months, you really have all those skills and even some extra skills in place to go out there and get hired in the workforce. Another cool thing we offer is a de-risked education, which means that you do not have to pay anything to get started. So we will go ahead and defer your tuition payment until you get the job. So you do not pay anything until you are hired. After you're hired, doing a programming job, making more 50K or over, then you'll give us a portion of your salary. So you'll slowly pay us back over the first year or two years. That way you don't have to finance, you don't have to worry about getting a loan. You just work through Lambda School to make sure that one, you get that job you want, and two, that you're able to attend Lambda School regardless of the situation right now. So that's Lambda School for you. It's a really great way to get into the software engineering industry. If you're not able to do a full-time course, we also do offer a part-time course. That's a year long in the evenings. So if you have any questions about Lambda School or the admission process, Karen Zachary is in Slack. She's a great person to talk to. Hopefully you guys have all already had a conversation with her, but reach out to her if you haven't already. So we're just about to wrap up the mini boot camp here. So, um, so I hope that a lot of you guys are feeling prepared to go into that interview process. If you are still uh, struggling a little bit with, um, if you're still struggling a little bit with the concepts that we've covered so far, that's pretty normal and not too much of a concern. Just take a little extra time. We really have thrown a lot at you in two weeks. Uh, the first two weeks I, of me learning how to code, it was nowhere near this much content. So if you need to take some time after we finish to go back, rewatch videos, do the homework, that's really normal and totally fine. So, um, But anyways, let's get on to some programming so that I can throw some even more crazy knowledge at you. So tonight is going to be all about classes. Classes are a really critical part of object-oriented programming. So if you're coming from C or Java, tonight's lesson will look really familiar. If you're not coming from those languages, that's totally fine. But once you do get to see uh, this type of stuff we're doing in JavaScript will really lay the foundation for that. So classes are great. They're essentially our way of creating our own JavaScript data type. But before we get into how to actually write classes, we need to have a little bit, we need to have a little chit chat about what JavaScript data types actually are. So before we get into the hard coding, we're gonna talk about something kind of conceptual and weird. So I'll throw this guy that I this at you guys at the beginning because it's a little mind boggling and your brains are hopefully all fresh right now. So um, you may have noticed that throughout my JavaScript courses, I have been using the word object in a couple different ways. So last night for the second half of the lesson, we talked all about objects as in this data structure, right? We declared these objects using the little curly brackets and we had those key value pairs and we saw that we could look things up and even add methods on. 
So most of the time when you hear the word objects said in regards to JavaScript, we mean that. We mean explicitly when you create an object with the curly brackets and the pairs. Um, but you might have noticed in earlier lessons, I would sometimes use the word object. Um, when talking about different data types, I sometimes use the word object in general. So I might say different JavaScript objects like strings or numbers. So there's some confusion there, right? There is, um, what do objects really mean? If objects are this one specific data type, then how could strings or numbers also be considered objects? And it turns out that this deals with this question really fundamental to what's actually going on in JavaScript. And so I'm going to let you guys know right now the biggest secret of JavaScript. Are you ready? Everything is an object. So those things we learned about last night with the curly brackets, those are, of course, objects. But arrays, which we also learned last night, are also objects. They're just secretly objects. And strings, also objects, but like secretly. And numbers, booleans, all objects. So it turns out that behind the scenes, everything is an object. So you could think about it as, think about JavaScript as being a play. So, um, so all, of the, all of the actors, on the, everyone on the stage is just an actor, but they're all playing these different roles. So for example, you know, one actor might be wearing a string costume and there are all these props that come along with being a string, like having a length property or having different string methods. You know, another of these things might be wearing a number costume and numbers have all sorts of things attached to their number costume, like how we can compare them, um, how we can add them together, subtract them, use these math operations on them. Some of the things in JavaScript are wearing an array costume. And as we saw, there's a bunch of cool stuff attached to the array costume, uh, such as prop other properties and methods and this indexing notation. Um, but then you could think of an object as in the thing with the curly brackets has been the narrator. So it's on the stage, it's playing its role, but there's no costume. It's not trying to pretend to be anything extra than what it already is. So I know that's conceptually a little weird to say, okay, a string is a string, but it's also secretly an object. So I'm going to go ahead and switch over to sharing my screen right now so that we can play a little bit with these and just explore this idea a little bit more. Then as we jump into classes, I'll find other ways of bringing in this concept and hopefully it'll start to solidify. So if this doesn't make complete total sense to you right now, that's totally fine. That's actually quite expected. But this is an idea I wanted to introduce you to now so you can start to mull it over. And as you get more and more practice with JavaScript, it'll start to click. So I'm gonna share my screen and we can talk just a little bit more about this object idea. So here we go. So when we created our objects last night, just as a little review of syntax, we uh, declare them like any other variable, and then we use the curly brackets to indicate we are working with an object. Then we have these key value pairs. So we might have property one, and then some sort of value, property two, another value, is my Y. And then we saw that not only can we have these um, properties we put on, we can also create methods. So we could create a method. And of course, a method is a function. And then inside this, we'll just make it go. OK, so this object I've created, which is very meta, has two properties and a method. And as we know, we can use dot notation to look up the value of property one. We could look up the value of property two, or we could even execute our method. The one thing that we briefly touched on last night is this idea that I'm kind of using the word property and method in a slightly different way, it seems like when I'm talking about an object. Because for example, if I had a string, we know that strings also have properties like dot length.
so we can look up the length using the length property on our strings. We also know that strings have um, methods like to uppercase, for example, which uppercases the contents of our string. And so in the case of strings or arrays, we do have properties and methods, but they are built in. We would think of a property as some sort of built-in thing that we could use, or a method as a built-in function that we can execute. Down here with the object, we're using those words in slightly different ways. Now a property is something that we create ourselves, and a method is something we create ourselves. So hopefully this will give you a little bit of insight into what's actually going on behind the scenes. So behind the scenes, someone had to create a string, right? The JavaScript developers had to actually say, what is a string, how does it work, what properties and methods, and when they did that, they used something very similar to what we do here. So when we're creating an object, we're actually kind of looking under the hood and creating something in this fundamental way that the JavaScript developers did themselves. So we can't really look totally behind the scenes at a string. It's designed in a way so we don't have to worry about what's going on in the background. But the JavaScript developers, when they created strings, defined all these properties and methods on it so we could use them. So in this case, these things are built in for us to use because the actual defining of them was behind the scenes. That's why we would say that even though a string is an object, it's kind of secretly an object. Whereas with our object, it's, there's no secret. We're the ones actually creating these methods and properties. So once again, I know that this is a difficult concept to fully understand. Uh, I just wanted to introduce it for now. And I think it will start to make sense as we dive into classes. So as I mentioned that behind the scenes, the JavaScript developers were adding these properties and methods. You might be thinking to yourself, well, if I wanted to create an entirely new JavaScript data type, could I do that too? And the answer is yes. Now that you know how to create an object, you're 90% of the way there to being able to create essentially your own new types in JavaScript. And they're not exactly called types, they're called classes. So that is what we are going to spend the rest of tonight talking about, is something called classes. And in classes, we will use our knowledge of objects to actually define a whole new type in JavaScript. So let me go ahead and start by showing you an example where we might want to create a class. So let's start by building an object. I'm gonna call this object Ninja Assassin. So once again, I'm using my curly brackets to indicate that this is an object. Uh, I will give it a name property. How about code name? Um, I'm going to give it a weapon property. We know ninjas must, must have weapons. Well, assassins in general need weapons. I'm going to give it a Boolean property called stealth. And that's true. And then I'm going to give it a kill count, which will start it at zero. We're just creating our ninja assassin. So for now, it'll be a zero. And then finally, let's go ahead and throw a method on this thing. So we're going to do a kill method. And what the kill method does is it just increments our kill count. So notice that I'm using the keyword this. I introduced that briefly last night. So I'm just saying, Take the property kill count on the object we're on, and then I'm using the plus plus operator to increment the value. So now that we've created our ninja assassin, we can use dot notation to look up different values, like we could look up the stealth. We could also just look at everything that's inside of this object. And if we wanted to, we could call our kill function, our kill method, and then Go ahead and see that, sure enough, after we call it, our kill count has incremented. And if we wanted to get a little violent here, we could run it three different times, and then we'd see that our kill count was all the way up to three. So this thing is an object. We've just used everything we learned last night to create ourselves a JavaScript assassin. But you know what's better than one assassin? Two assassins. So let's go ahead and create another assassin. This one is going to be called the character assassin. 
And of course, we want a code name. We want a weapon. Stealth value, false. The character assassin is not stealthy. Kill count, still gonna start at zero since we're only starting out and we have a kill function, which kill count plus plus. Okay, cool. So we have created ourselves another assassin. So great, we are up to two assassins now. We have our ninja assassin and our character assassin. But do you want to know what's better than two assassins? Three assassins. So let's go ahead and create another one. I'm going to just copy and paste this code over. And we'll call this one ghost assassin. I'm going to change a couple values here. Update that. Cool. OK, so we have just created three assassins. and. Uh, if you haven't recognized the pattern so far, obviously the more assassins the better. So I could just keep going on and creating more and more assassins here, kind of following the similar pattern, but you hopefully have noticed that I am repeating myself like crazy and we always want to practice dry coding. Don't repeat yourself. So this is bad. What I've just done is bad. Notice how I literally copied and pasted a piece of code and then changed values. That should be like alarm bells going off for you guys. If you're copying and pasting, there's probably a better way to do it. So we saw with everything we've done so far, different ways that we can practice dry coding. If we're running the same bit of logic a bunch of times, we could maybe loop it or possibly even write a function to execute it. Uh, when we have a bunch of different variables that sort of go together, Instead of just declaring five different variables, we could put them all in an array. And similar to that, if we find ourselves creating a bunch of different objects that have a really similar form, that tells us that we want a class. And remember, a class is essentially a new JavaScript type, or maybe I'll just say a custom JavaScript type. So wouldn't it be cool if there were a JavaScript type called an assassin, and we could use it to just create a bunch of different assassins really easily. Well, we can't exactly create a new type, but we can create a class, which really just does that for us. So that's our goal for the, next, for the rest of class, is to instead of just keep writing out, copying and pasting and writing out an individual object for every single assassin, we want to create a template for what is an assassin in a general sense, and then we can just like bust them out. So that's our goal. Let's go ahead and we're gonna comment these out because as we know, this is what not to do. Too much repetition. And then down here, we're gonna go ahead and create that class. So I'm going to call it the assassin class. So let's, this is the first step. Let's pause right here to talk about what I've even done so far. First of all, notice that I declared a variable using my typical variable declaration syntax, but I did one thing different, and that is I capitalized my variable name. So you might have noticed that all my variable names so far have been, um, have been either lowercase or camel case, which means starting with the second word on, we capitalize. And by convention, you don't capitalize variable names in JavaScript unless they're classes. So by convention, you, you capitalize a class. So when I say by convention, what I mean is that it's not like it's going to throw an error if you don't do this. But every single JavaScript developer out there, when they see a capitalized, um, cl when they see a capitalized variable name, they think, oh, that's a class. Or when they see a class, they're like, oh, I need to capitalize the variable name. So you want to do this just because it's kind of this um, unofficial rule that pretty much everyone follows. So that's really how we would know, even from just looking at this line of code, this is a class. It's also important to signify that because notice that I've just used the same syntax as creating a function. Um, there's no extra keyword, at least when we're just defining our class to say this is a class. We just write it out like we're writing a function. So that's another important reason to capitalize this is it's a queue 
to tell us, okay, this isn't actually a function, it's a class, which is slightly different. So anyways, that is how we start. Um, as with a normal function, we still have parameters that we pass in. So when you're trying to figure out what kind of parameters does my class need, look up at your different instances, these examples up here, and say, okay, what changes every time? So there are some things that are the same between these three. But notice that every time the code name is different, the weapon is different, and the stealth value is going to be different. So that means that those need to be parameters. We need to be able to pass those in when we create a new one. So I'm going to say um, CN for code name. Um, I'll do W for weapon, and then I'll do S for stealth. So, OK, we have code name, weapon, and stealth. So what we do now is we actually want to define out all the properties that we want to put on our um, on each instance. So each individual object, they're going to have properties. So for now, we're going to skip the method. Um, we'll get to the method in a little bit, but let's just start out with the four properties. So of course, we're going to have a code name. So we'd say this dot code name. Now we want to do this dot weapon. Uh, this dot stealth and this dot kill count. So what I've just done is I've created all these properties that we want on each instance. So when I say the word instance, I mean each individual assassin. So this thing I'm creating here is like a template. It's like a rule book for how to build assassins. And so you would call that the class. The class is the rule book. So I'll even put this up here in the comments. So class is the rule book, whereas an instance is an individual member of the class. That's the difference between a class and an instance. You'll hear me using both of those words a lot. So up here in the rule book, we've said, OK, every instance should have these four properties. And we use our keyword this to define the properties. But right now, all we're doing is uh, giving them empty properties. So all these would be undefined because we haven't put any values in. Well, we can go ahead and assign each of these. We know that our CN parameter should go into code name. We know that our W um, parameter should go into weapon. The S should go into stealth. And in kill count, notice that there's no input for kill count because in every case, it's just going to auto start to zero. So we can hard code that as zero. And that says, OK, when we create an individual assassin, when we create an instance, this will just start out at zero, whereas these ones will be set to values based on our input. So a little note, um, oftentimes you'll see the properties and the parameters named the same. So it would be pretty common to see that this is actually called code name. So you'd see something like this. I didn't do it that way because I think this makes it a little confusing because we have like eight things named code name floating around. So if you do see code that looks like this, which you will in the homework, note that the code name on the right side of the um, assignment, on the right side of the equal sign refers to the parameter I'm saying hey, take the value that was passed in and store it here. The code name on the left side is saying, this is the name of the property. So it matters that these two match. These two have to match. This has to match that, et cetera. Whereas this has to match what we actually want to appear in the instance. We couldn't do that or else the property name would be CN, which is not very clear. So let's do it that way. So I'll leave this like this, but you'll see in the homework um, another example where I've actually typed out the full property names. So anyways, that is, uh, that's it. You know, as I said, we've skipped over our method for now, but this is the basic uh, setup for the class. So we've just pretty much written the rule book. We've said, okay, there are these things called assassins. They have these four properties. And for these three, we want the user to be able to customize their value. So that is how you write a class. Pretty simple. As we see uh, syntax-wise, it looks really similar to making a function. But there's some different stuff going on in here. We don't have a return value for one, and I will get to that in a minute. And we're also heavily utilizing the this keyword. 
So even just looking at it, apart from the capitalized variable name, we can kind of tell, okay, this isn't a function, this is a class. So let's create some instances now. So um, we wanna create our uh, four friends from, or three friends from above. So let's start with our ninja assassin. Okay, so to create an instance, it's similar to calling a function. So we still have to use the class name with the parentheses, just like we were calling a function, but notice that I now use this keyword new. So there is one keyword that we'll kind of use when it comes to classes, and that's the keyword new. So let me finish up this statement. We'll see how the Ninja Assassin panned out, and then I want to break down this new keyword for you. So we've called Assassin, but just like with functions, we need to pass in some arguments. So I want my code name. I want my weapon and I want my stealth value. So I've passed all of those in, and then let's look at our ninja friend. So once again, we're still, we still haven't put on that method, but apart from that, we've created an object that looks just like our object up here, but using our template instead. So let's go ahead and uh, just create all three of those for you, so. I'm gonna copy this over. I know I said a warning about copying and pasting. It's okay if you're just copying and pasting one line. Uh, when you start to copy and paste chunks of code, that's when the red flags should be going off. So um, the next assassin we had was our character assassin. And this guy was called false, okay. And then the last one we had was our ghost friend, our ghost assassin. Okay, let me scroll up a little bit and let me just console log the three of these so that we can make sure they're all created as we expected. And then console log. So as a reminder, the reason I'm console logging here is because I want to see all three lines of all three of these. So Replit will automatically show us the last one, but if we want to see multiple items, we probably have to use a console log. So, okay. So in our console, in white, we can see that barring that method that I haven't gotten to yet, all, um, all four of these were created, or three. There are three, why do I keep thinking there are four? <laughs> all four of these three, ah, numbers, all three of these were created, there are three. Um, counting, not my strong suit. So anyways, um, so we have managed to create these three objects without ever having to explicitly type what was in all of them. We use this class to template out what they all were supposed to look like, and then we created um, three different instances using the new keyword and calling our assassin class. So that is how we actually use these classes to create instances. So let me talk about this keyword new in just a little more detail here. So some stuff is going on behind the scenes when this function calls. Um, so for example, the first thing that happens behind the scenes is that an object called this is created. So by default, this is an empty object. So because uh, this object is created behind the scenes, we can now go ahead and start to throw properties on it. If our this object weren't created, then this bit down here wouldn't work. The next thing that happens behind the scenes is we return this. So as I briefly mentioned, um, this uh, function, which is actually a class, doesn't have a return value. If this were a normal function, then we wouldn't be able to get anything out of calling this because there's no return value. But when we call it with the new keyword, the return happens behind the scenes. So we don't even, basically, it's just JavaScript's way of saving us writing two lines of code because they write those lines of code for us behind the scenes. And two lines isn't a lot, but if you're writing a bunch of classes, then you probably should be thankful that some stuff is happening behind the scenes. So that's a little bit of what the keyword new does. So notice that if I get rid of it for my ghost assassin, I just say, okay, I'm gonna call assassin on its own. 
Now JavaScript will interpret this as being a function. And because it's a function, these things don't actually happen and we get no return value. In other words, our ghost assassin becomes undefined. So the short answer to that is new is important. If we don't use new, it won't work. So make sure you use your new keyword whenever you're creating instances. I know you're just learning functions and you're probably all used to running functions without this keyword, but with classes, it is critical to include that keyword because important stuff is happening behind the scenes that will not happen if we leave it out. All right, so um, let's go ahead and get to that method. I know I'm sure you guys have been eager to figure out how to write that method in so that we can actually do some killing with our assassins. So you might be thinking, well, couldn't we write our method exactly the way we wrote these properties and just do this.kill equals function this dot kill count plus plus. And so if we do this, it seems to work. Now all of these have a kill method on them. So that's pretty nice, right? That's what we wanted. And then if we, let's go ahead and do some killing with our ghost friend. We'll do a couple ones. And then if we look inside of ghost assassin, Notice that it's worked. The kill count has been incremented. So we might be thinking, sweet, we've added our method. All is good. And yes and no. So this approach to writing methods, it works, but it's not ideal. So let me explain why this is not ideal. So, um, so let's see what happens. Let's break down what happens in detail. So once again, remember that this is just a rule book. And every time we create a new instance, this code runs. So when we create Ninja Assassin, what happens is this code runs, we create a new function, and it's stored in memory inside of our Ninja Assassin. So we've created a kill. When this line executes, we create a new kill function and store it inside of this object. So when this line of code runs, we create another new kill function and store it in here. And then when this line of code runs, we create a third kill function and store it in memory here. So the way I have this code set up right now, there are three different kill functions existing in memory. Now let's imagine that we are the baddest crime boss in the world, unless of course one of you out there is an actual crime boss, in which case you do not have to imagine. But if we are this crime boss who has like a thousand assassins that we're employing, then we're gonna wanna create a thousand instances. And that means a thousand copies of this function in memory. So that's not good because notice that this function every time looks exactly the same. So we've just created in memory a thousand copies of the exact same thing. That means that literally on our physical hard drive, we have to have space to store a thousand of these. Um, and a thousand still isn't very much in computer, you know, in terms of computer stuff, but it's, it is still a waste of space. But now let's imagine that, you know, we have a million of these. Um, and maybe it's a little crazy to imagine having a million assassins, but what if we were writing a class for Facebook? So if we're writing a class for a Facebook user, there are millions of Facebook users, which means millions of the same methods all being copied and that is just a so if we have you know a million facebook users each with several methods each that's a ton of stuff that we're repeating in memory and we're just wasting space so even though practically this works and if we only have a couple instances it's kind of no big deal this really isn't a good scalable way to write a method because we're just wasting space and if we're a crime boss you know we need money for like to you know, bury people in the desert or to, you know, have a solid gold chain or, you know, whatever else crime bosses do. So we don't want to be wasting our memory on hard drive space that we don't need. Okay, so that was a big explanation, I know, of why um, we don't want to create an individual copy of this. So what do we do instead? Well, there's something that exists called the prototype, and it's designed exactly for... Um, for this problem. So the assassin 
keep in mind the assassin, this variable is the class. So this is like the rule book. Um, it doesn't refer to any one particular assassin. This variable refers to the potential to create different instances, which is why we call it when we want to create one. Um, but apart from being able to call it, like we've seen down here, there's also an object on it called prototype. Prototype. So assassin.prototype is just an empty object by default. In fact, I'm going to console log it just so we can even look at it. So let's run this. And we see that, uh oh, let's get rid of that for now. Um, we see, sure enough, that assassin.prototype, as I just promised, is an empty object. But it's kind of a special empty object. It is the place designed to store communal methods. Communal of, I think it's two Ms. I have to always apologize for my spelling. I think I'm fine at spelling, except when I'm teaching live, in which case all of a sudden words look weird. Okay, so storage for communal methods. Hopefully someone out there will tell me if I've spelled things wrong and made a fool of myself. Um, okay, so that is the storage for the methods. So right now it's empty, but it's a place designed so that we can type out our methods. So I'm going to put my kill method instead of inside of the rule book on the prototype. So I will do this dot kill count plus plus. So it still looks, except that I've spelled kill wrong. Um, Oh, cool, I have spelled communal right, yay. Um, so, not kill, but communal, okay. So it looks exactly the way it did before, but we've just put it in a different place. So why would we do this? Well, the reason is that now we have one copy. So we've created one copy right here on line 46 through 48, and that's the only one that's going to exist. So let me go ahead and log my assassin friends again. I'll just log two of them because I'm lazy. Okay, so when we log them, notice that there isn't a kill property on them. And that's what we see on the console reflects what's really happening. There literally is no kill property on this individual instance or this individual instance or this one either. But what happens when I call ninja assassin dot kill? We don't get an error and it seems to have worked. So what is this madness? How did that happen? Well, when we call a method, the first thing that happens behind the scenes is we check and see, okay, is there a kill property on this object? And in this case, we know no, there isn't. So first it checks for a kill property on Ninja Assassin. If it doesn't find it, it doesn't just give up. It now defaults to the prototype. It knows the prototype is this communal pool for methods. So if it doesn't find the method on the instance, it looks on the rulebook's prototype. So it looks on this object. And in this case, it found it. So it was able to execute it correctly. If this didn't exist, then it would totally error out. But because there's um, because the kill function exists on the prototype, it's able to find it. And in this way, there's just one copy of the kill function. So even if I have a million assassins, this function only exists once in memory. And it's able to work with any assassin instance. So what is kind of the true magic behind why we're able to have one copy of the function that works with any instance? And that gets off the keyword this. So we were briefly introduced to the keyword this last night, but we really don't have a chance to see how powerful it is until right now. So the keyword this is dynamic. It refers to whatever object the function is called on. So when I call ninja assassin.kill, this refers to whatever is on the left side of the dot. If I called instead ghost assassin.kill, now this changes and refers to ghost assassin. So in that way, this one line of code can increment this property on a bunch of different objects, just depending on who's actually calling the method. So this is a bit of a rascal. And when I say this, I mean literally the keyword this is a rascal. 
for me personally, it was probably the hardest thing for me to master in learning JavaScript. And I'll admit, I'm not perfect. I still have my moments where I'm like, oh crap, what is this going to refer to? Um, but the rule of thumb is that whenever you have a function with this inside of it, it will refer to whatever is on the left side of the dot where that method is being called. So this, extremely useful for writing methods. So there you have it. I've broken it down in a lot of detail, but we now know our correct way to create um, these assassins. And if you have any doubts about it being better than our first bit of code, let me show you a few reasons why we don't like the first bit of code. So first of all, notice that when I created these things explicitly, let's see, this was about a little under 30 lines of code. So about 30 lines of code to create three objects. Down here, and I have some comments here, so it's taking up even more space, we have line 35 to line 53. So that's less than 20 lines of code plus comments, so really more like 15. So really we've taken half the amount of space to do the same thing, which is already great, but even better than that, now every single time we wanna create a new assassin, if I wanted a five new assassins, that's just five new lines of code. Whereas up here, every line, every new assassin is like almost 10 lines of code. So it's really way more efficient. But even beyond just how much code we're writing, notice that if I wanted to change kill count, if I'm like, well, you know what, head count is a better property name. Now I have to remember to change it in three different places. And if I forgot to change it on one of them, things would be confusing. If I wanted to change it down here, I would change it on, I would also have to change it down here. But now notice, oh, and up here, I would have to also change it on all three of these. See, problem, I had to change it in six places. And if I had a thousand of these assassins, I would have to change it in 2000 places. Whereas down here, no matter how many assassins I have, I just changed it in two places and it's been changed for all of them. So now we, oh, it's giving me an error. Let me get rid of this again. I can't have two variables with the same name. Okay, so now we see that headcount updated and it really updated for all three. So just another reason why we like classes. So in the, on that note, I'm going to just delete all this code because we don't like it. Okay, so those are classes. Um, that's pretty much all there is to it, to creating classes. Really powerful tool. And you know, you're gonna get a lot of practice playing with this tonight. I did wanna kind of bring everything full circle and come back to this idea I started with about everything secretly being an object. So now we've gotten this really insider look into more or less what the JavaScript developers were doing when they created uh, things like arrays or strings or numbers. You know, they had to define out, okay, what are the properties? What are the initial values going to be? Um, and then things like, what are the methods? So now that we know a little bit of some of the secrets of what's going on behind the scenes, we can see some pretty cool stuff. So I'm going to go ahead and I'll leave this on here because we might want it for the Q&A, but let me just create a blank screen here. So, okay, let's create an array. So we'll do, um, really weird collection of animals. <laughs> I better, for the sake of Bisbee, I better throw on a javelina on here. Um, okay, cool. So here I have this array of five different animals. So as we know, an array is an array and it has, that means it has some built-in methods, it has a length property, but we also now know the animals is secretly an object, right? So that means that we have some insight into some stuff that's going on behind the scenes. For example, we can figure out that, okay, because this has um, methods, if the JavaScript developers were doing what they were supposed to, 
those methods probably exist on the prototype. And that brings us to this question that someone asked last night that I wasn't really able to properly answer, which is why are these things all listed as array.prototype.method? That's because literally that's where they live. There's a class called array and it has a method called prototype or sorry, an object called prototype on it. And every single method that we can use on an array lives on the prototype. So a fun way to look at that is to actually open the console. Unfortunately, um, Repolit doesn't really let us look behind the scenes, which is lame, but we can do this on the console. And I apologize, I know the console is tiny. I still haven't figured out a way to make it bigger. If anyone else does, please let me know. So, okay, so let's slide this over and we can see, um, so let's go ahead and first look at Array. So we see that there's something called Array with a capitalization. And that is our little portal into all things array. If we look at the array.prototype, we can open this up and here they are. We can actually see all these array methods where they live on the prototype. We can do that with anything. We can look at string.prototype. There are all the string methods. We can look at number.prototype. Not quite as interesting. There's not as much stuff we can do with a number, but any data type, we can look at the prototype. And that gives us a little peek, one, into what all the methods are, and two, it makes us realize that these data types that are built into JavaScript aren't actually too different from these classes that we can custom build ourselves. So let's pop back out of the console and play with that now that we know it exists. So what are some fun things we can do with the prototype? Well, if we want to troll our fellow developers, we could do this. So we know that animals.pop is a method, right? And so when we run animals.pop, when we look inside animals, we see that, oh, that's right, I have all this code down here. Go away, code, you're in my way. Sorry, one second. So when we do animals.pop, we see that we popped off our javelina, our last animal on the list. But let's say we wanted to troll our fellow developers. We could do array.prototype, prototype.pop. And as we know, it's a property, or so we can just overwrite it. So instead of popping like we're supposed to, let's just console log error cannot pop. So we have just overwritten a built-in method. So now when I run pop, we get error, cannot pop, and the javelina is still left on there. So um, yeah, maybe not the best thing to do. Uh, would really mess up your team if you actually put this on a production code base. But hey, you can do it. What's more useful than um, being a troll and overwriting existing methods is actually creating new ones. So let's say we, for some reason we had this bit of code where really often we had to access the second item in our array. So we know that we could just do animals at index one to get hummingbird, but we could also create a method that did it for us. So we can do this at index one, and that will give us our second value. And remember, this will just refer to whichever array we're calling it on. And then, of course, we have to return. So now if I do animals.getSecond, we return Hummingbird. And notice that if I also created a new array, call we'll call this one numbers, because numbers are the easiest to write. And if I called, instead of animals, numbers.getSecond, it works as well. So because we put our custom method on the prototype, um, it's going to work for any array. So this is a really actually quite useful tool because sometimes you'll be working in a code base where you have to frequently run some sort of logic on arrays or on strings and there's no built-in method. So instead of having to repeat yourself, you can always add that method onto the array prototype and now it's available for use. So that's just a little cool way that we can take what we've learned with classes and actually apply it to some of the other things we've worked with. So 
hopefully that brought things a little for, full circle. And what I said at the beginning of class makes a little more sense about why arrays are just secretly objects behind the scenes. And so if we want, we can customize them a little bit. All right, well, that is pretty much the lecture for tonight. I'll go ahead and um, I'll go ahead and uh, open up the floor to questions and then we can, oh, and it looks like someone gave me a little insight into how to make things bigger in the console. In retrospect, I probably could have Googled that and figured it out myself, but I appreciate you guys doing the hard work for me. So yes, um, questions. So any questions you have about classes, creating classes or instances, or working with a prototype, please ask now. I'm gonna play with the console in the meantime. Somewhere in here, perhaps, is how I make it bigger. <laughs> I have this really bad habit of seeing things without actually being able to comprehend what they're actually trying to tell me. I see a couple people typing. Uh, hopefully, we have some questions coming up. So please bear with me while I play with the settings in my console for a few more minutes while we wait for some questions to come in. I'll play with this outside of class. Yeah, so we have someone asking for just a, another clarification of what the prototype is. And it looks like uh, our Slack user has pretty much nailed it, which is that prototype is an object that stores all the methods of an element. Exactly. So, um, so think of prototype as the place that we put anything we want to collectively exist on all the instances. So generally speaking, they're gonna be methods inside of the prototype. Um, if you wanted to, you could create a property, um, but it would be collective. So I, you know, I really, I haven't seen putting, uh, putting properties on the prototype as being kind of a good use case. There might be a case where that makes sense. Like if you did array dot, let's try this. I love the question section. It always gives me an opportunity to like break the rules in some way I've never tried before. So sample property equals true. So let's just try array dot sample property. That equals true. So now every single thing has a sample property, but let's play with this. What happens if I change it to false? Now change it to false, but if I look at animals, sorry guys, I'm totally trying to figure something out. Hmm. Okay, so we can. It looks like we can also create a property in here, and it seems to work more or less okay. But mostly, I've seen the prototype as being the place where we store methods. That might be worth me doing a little bit of research on, so I have some extra knowledge. Okay, so we have a question called, uh, could you mention a good place or reference to check the topic of proper ways to create objects dynamically? So I'm not sure what exactly you mean by creating objects dynamically. Um, in terms of, I mean, in terms of any general JavaScript question, just Googling is a good way to go. MDN is a good go-to. So I'm not sure if you mean specifically creating classes or just general object creation, but anything you want to know, you could find an MDN. So you could try, you know, MDN um, objects, JavaScript. And if you just wanted some general references on what objects are and how to create them, you could search here and there's some, there's a description, 
There are some examples. Objects are can be pretty complicated when you really look into them because as I mentioned, secretly everything's an object. So um, this might not be the best starter place to learn about objects because it's a little technical. I really like YouTube as well. I think YouTube is a really great resource because I find that usually a you know five minute video online will explain something that reading through the documentation for like half an hour still leaves confusing. So um, if you if you can clarify a little bit more what you mean by creating objects dynamically, I could maybe give you a more specific answer. But in general, I would say Googling and just looking at YouTube are really good starting points if you're wondering about really anything. All right, let's give everyone a, another few minutes to keep throwing up questions in Slack. I always imagine at this point in the question section what it feels like to be the one typing the question and being like we're all waiting silently for the question to come in. Not to put any more pressure on the people typing. Okay, cool. So Lauren wants some clarification about this and new. So totally different keywords, but both really important. So let's go ahead down here to our class code and I will talk about both of those again. So I'm going to start with this. So, um, so here's, okay, I'm gonna break down in a little more detail why the keyword this is, for example, so important when typing out the kill. So we know that headcount needs to refer to a property on something. So let's try a few different things. So for starters, let's do assassin.headcount++, plus plus, right? That seems like that might make sense. We're saying on whatever assassin, then um, take the headcount property and do plus plus. So when we try to run this, notice that it didn't work. Even though we ran kill twice, our ninja assassin's headcount is still at zero. That's because the word assassin, the variable assassin refers to the rule book. That refers to this thing. This is a rule book that tells us what properties to put on our new instances. So even though we describe four properties in the rule book, the rule book itself, this object itself does not have any of these properties. So when we try to increment headcount on assassin, assassin.headcount doesn't even exist. If we console log assassin.headcount, we get undefined. So, um, so first we get undefined and second we get not a number. So after we've run this code, it becomes not a number, but clearly assassin.headcount is not a zero. So that doesn't work. Well, what else could we write here? Um, we could try to pick a specific instance like ninja assassin. We could hard code in our ninja assassin and Now it worked well, okay, wait a minute So we ran kill once on ninja assassin and once on ghost assassin But things are not working the way we want them to let me quickly console log both of these assassin friends so notice we've called kill on our ninja assassin once and on our ghost assassin once. Yet our ghost assassin has a zero head count and this one has two. That's because we hard coded in a specific instance, which means that we can only increment um, the value on that instance, regardless of who we're calling head count on. That's really bad. That's not how our head count should work. So hopefully this has shed some light in why this is important. This is saying, okay, yes, we want to refer to the headcount property on some instance, but we don't know who in advance. So now when we call line 24, it runs up and executes this, and this refers to ninja assassin. 
And when we call the kill function on ghost assassin, this refers to the ghost assassin. So really difficult concept to fully master. I will admit that. But in short, you can think about the keyword this as being kind of like this placeholder. Um, think about it as being, you know, when you go to the carnival and there's like a little picture with a head that's hollowed out and you can stick your face in and take a picture. That's what this is like. It's like a hollowed out face. And whoever calls the function, in this case, the ghost or the ninja assassin sticks its head in the, this, the empty this face. And in this case, it's the ghost. So this is this really weird, ambiguous keyword that can change values depending on who is calling the method. So that's another little explanation of this. I can just say right now, it's just probably gonna take a little practice before you get used to it. It's a weird keyword for sure. The other question was about the new keyword. So the new keyword is a little more straightforward. When you just call a function, um, regularly, it runs like a function. It looks for a return value um, and all of that. But we don't want to run assassin as a function. We want to run it as a method. So when you use the new keyword new followed by what would otherwise look like a function call, then it's saying, okay, we're creating an instance of a class. And extra stuff happens behind the scenes when this function runs, including that this is created. So in this case, this is kind of working different in that it's this empty object we can use, and then we return it behind the scenes. So in this case, this is working slightly different than down here, but it's still kind of this ambiguous keyword that's going to refer to different things every time we run it. So that is how the keyword new works. It adds some extra functionality so that these are actually treated as instances of a class. So from a user perspective, you don't fully have to understand new, you just need to know, make sure you use it whenever you're creating a new instance. Um, we have a question, I'm sorry, Keith, I don't fully understand your question. So we, so Keith was asking, what does the get in front of an object do? Like get, I, oh, I think you're asking about the homework tonight, right? So um, let me, actually that's a good opportunity for me to just talk about the homework tonight. And let me, sorry, let me pull it up behind the scenes here so I can um, fully answer Keith's question. Give me one second. Okay, so let me actually, before I answer Keith's question, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the, um, about the homework in general. So the homework tonight is a little different, and I will say it is quite challenging, um, and it's kind of forcing you to do something a little different than what you've done before. So I've given you a lot more code than you're used to seeing tonight. Um, so there are only a couple of questions, but they're challenging questions because there's a bunch of code that I've provided that you'll have to work with. So I create a class, let me just copy this on over from the homework. So I actually created a class for the homework tonight called HTML element. So notice um, I've got a bunch of document or a bunch of comments up here that'll help you understand it. So HTML element is a class, we can tell, right? Because it's capitalized. And so this thing is going to you can put in values and create some a JavaScript object that kind of imitates an HTML element. So it's your job to use this class that I've created. So I've also included some, um, some examples of different um, methods on this thing. So, okay, let me see where he's actually referring to get ID and good classes. Okay, there they are. So, um, within, within this uh, homework assignment, there is a method called toString. So HTML element .prototype string. This thing is really complex. And I have a comment above it that says, hey, this thing is really complex. And you do not have to understand this logic to do the homework. 
In fact, that is part of the bonus question. But just don't feel like you have to understand what's going on in two string because it is really complicated and was actually really fun to write. Um, inside of it, there are two functions called get ID and get classes. There's nothing special. So there's a function called, let me just even copy it over. So there's a function called get ID that I wrote for you. Here it is. So the name of this function is just get ID. That's just a name I came up with for the function. So it's not, get isn't some special JavaScript thing. That's literally just what I chose to name the function because it made sense to me. So don't read too much into the get, Keith. It's just, uh, it's just something that I named these, fun these little helper functions. And also, don't be too frazzled by all the crazy code inside of this two string. Um, it's like 30, wait, it's like 40 lines of code long. It's really long. So you guys don't have to understand it in order to do the homework. You just have to be able to use it. And it is really simple to use, so, okay. All right, so we had a little question about, um, about let and const and how it applies to these instances. So let me, uh, I'll use this opportunity to create a really simple class. So we're gonna have a class called user and our users will have a username and a password. And literally, it'll just be Okay, cool. So if I want to create a new user, let's say user1, I would use the keyword new. I'd put in the username. So there's my username and my of course, go to password, ABC123. Use it for all my bank accounts. Um, and then I can look inside of user1. So just like any other variable, we would use const here by default because we probably want user1 to just always be this user. And remember that that doesn't mean that we can't change the password. If we wanted to, we could change the password to um, 123ABC instead. So even though um, user1 is a constant, we can still change the individual properties inside of it. That's fine. But if I tried to use that same variable and create another user inside of it, notice that I get an error. That's because I've tried to create a totally new user and save it in this variable. And it doesn't even have to be a user. Let's say I wanted to just put a string in there. Remember that when we use the keyword const, whatever we put into it the first time we declare it, that is the only value we could possibly store in this. Whereas if I had used let, and I wanted to change user1 to be equal to a Boolean for some reason, I could do that without any problems. So by default, as with everything else, you really would probably want your instances to be constant. Um, I really can't think of a good use case where you would actually want to be changing these. Maybe if you're looping through users, like for example, let's say we had an array of users and we're looping through, maybe we might want to do, you know, let user. Um, but apart from something like that, you'd probably just want to use constant when you're creating an instance of a class. All right, any other questions out there? Okay, cool. Well, I will let you get to the homework. Uh, hopefully you guys aren't too scared by what I've talked about so far. I will say this is one of the more challenging assignments, but I think this is a really cool assignment because it really gets at one of the most important skills in being a programmer, which is reading code. So you'll find that a lot of your job when you actually become a software developer is reading other people's code, and it's way more easy to tell something what something you've written means than what something someone else written eh, what someone else has written means. So this will give you a really good practice in trying to deal with some confusing and maybe even intimidating code that you're seeing for the first time. But don't let that scare you because if you just play around with it a little and get patient and utilize everything we talked about tonight, 
you'll figure out how to use it. It's also similar to reading documentation. You just kind of have to read the comments, follow the clues, and it'll start to make sense. All right, well, that is it for tonight. We talked about classes and objects, and I'm really excited when we get to this part of the mini boot camp because we're really starting to touch on what's actually going on behind the scenes in JavaScript. I hope you guys enjoy the homework tonight. As always, reach out on Slack if you're stuck or if you have any questions. Um, if you initially get stuck, try Googling. Always a good place to start. Try checking out YouTube videos. Um, also a really good skill. I mean, I'm sure no one's teaching is as impeccable as mine, but sometimes it's nice to just hear it from someone else's perspective. All right, well, that's it. And tomorrow we will have our last lesson. So I will see you guys then and have a great night. Thanks, guys. Bye.